I'm Erin Larson. I'm uh, with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, the Wildlife Health Section. We're here today at the Wisconsin Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, or WVDL as we call it. They test all of our Wisconsin deer for CWD. So just to remind you of how the process works, well, hopefully you'll be lucky enough to harvest a deer. If you want it sampled for CWD, you go online at dnr.wi.gov to find a CWD sampling site take your deer to get uh, the samples removed. They're brought to our Black Earth Processing Center for preparation for testing, and then delivered here to our neighbor at WEDL. I'm here with Dan Barr, who is the TSE lab manager, and he's going to show us all the steps that take place to get the test result for your deer. All right, thank you, Aaron. Uh, wonderful introduction. I appreciate the, the DNR reaching out and coming in today. Uh, Aaron and I have been working together for quite a number of years. <laughs> So we've got a, a history of, of collaboration. This is my 17th uh, deer season, working at the WVDL, testing hunter samples for chronic wasting disease. Uh, of course, uh, this process is very near and dear to my heart, as I was part of the first group of people that established this testing laboratory, uh, and it remained the only original employee still left here. Um, may have something to do with my stubborn nature uh, or my passion for white-tailed deer and uh, chronic wasting disease. So what we're going to do today is walk you through the process once the samples are received from Black Earth uh, Processing Center here at WVDL, which is located down on the west end of the UW campus. Uh, so we're going to take a little walk, show you the laboratory. This is 742 square feet uh, of highly efficient testing. In years past, we've test uh, 20,000 to 30,000 samples in about a six to eight week period. Uh, that is no small feat, as it is no small feat for the wildlife agencies, um, not only in Wisconsin, but around the country, to collect those samples for the testing. So what we're going to do is start with sample preparation. And we've got Sophia Miranda here working inside of a biosafety cabinet. The importance of the biosafety cabinet is it keeps uh, the, the sample from being contaminated by other samples or any uh, human interaction. It also keeps the human safe from uh, whatever the sample is. Uh, it uses HEPA filtration um, to ensure both the sample and, and the human are safe. So what Sophia is doing is taking a pre-labeled sample from the Wisconsin DNR uh, which has two separate IDs on it. One is a deer ID, which the hunter uses to track their sample um, through the testing process. And the other is a sample ID, which uh, is another triangulation point between the DNR sample and the sample that's actually sent to WVDL. So what Sophia does is ensures the, the sample that she's working on is the uh, incorrect line with the sample that we think it is and what we do is log all of our samples into a central database um, give it another unique identifier which allows us to track the sample all the way through the process and that's incredibly important um, not only to us as lab workers but to the hunter uh, because that ensures that the sample that they submitted to the DNR matches the result that they get back from us um, as far as the steps go in the process, Sophia measures out 200 milligrams of the tissue uh, from the outer edge of the lymph node, which contains the highest concentration uh, and most likely position of the abnormal prion protein. She then minces that portion of the sample uh, into three or four smaller pieces and adds that to uh, a small tube, which you can see here in the background, that contains uh, a sample uh, Dilution liquid, I guess is the easiest way to say it. And then there are also very small white ceramic beads inside. We also add a large ceramic bead that's yellow in color and add this, this whole concoction into a piece of equipment called a tissue homogenizer. These are very uh, robust pieces of equipment and we can fit 48 samples around the ring of this, uh, this sample holder. 
and the, the tubes that I'm using are not pre-labeled because they're uh, just counter balances, counterweights basically. Um, but essentially what happens is the samples are loaded, the lid is placed on top, and there's a, a vacuum pump that kicks in that sucks the lid down onto the container. And if it's a lymph node sample, it spins for 45 seconds at 6,500 RPMs. And it, what it essentially does is turns that solid lymph node tissue into a, a protein shake, if you will. Um, a, a pretty homogenous liquid that allows us to extract the, the normal and the abnormal prion proteins. Uh, I'm gonna start it up and, and stop it quick so you can see the violence at which this machine operates. And again, imagine that uh, two 45 second cycles uh, with a brief 30 second uh, pause in the middle. Once the sample is homogenized, we move on to the next step of the process which is sample transferring. And we're gonna have Ben Johnson step in here. Uh, ben has been with the lab for 11 years now. Um, resident, former resident of Minnesota, same as Aaron, uh, now happily residing in this wonderful town of Madison. So what Ben is going to do is identify the sample um, that is going from the, the proper tube location to the proper well location. And he's gonna use the, the tip of the syringe to go under the ceramic beads, and those ceramic beads act as a particulate filter uh, to ensure that we're just getting liquid into the, into the sample well. So you can see the setup that we're using is a 96 well format. Uh, the first six wells we use for negative and positive controls. Uh, that's important in ensuring the, the validity the validity of the test uh, and the overall sensitivity and specificity of that test. So when we get 90 samples into that deep well micro titer plate, we move on to protein purification. Um, luckily, the BioRed bio -red system that we use has uh, an automated purification step. So we're gonna circle back around to where we started essentially. take a look at this piece of equipment and it's got a, a, a software associated with it that, that operates on a protocol and what we've got over on this side uh, is a place to put unused um, sterile tips and then this stacker picks up the, the empty uh, tips that are used in the assay. We've also got a waste drawer that deposits the used tips um, the tips are only used once. Once they come in contact with the sample, they are discarded uh, and new sterile fresh tips are picked up. Then what we do is add a, a sample plate to this side and uh, a calibration plate or a sample, sample plate to the other side. And what's happening is this machine is going to shift to the left and right, moving this table to pick up a sample, put it into the the, the second sample plate and incubate it at 37 degrees for about 10 minutes. And then it's going to add a, a solution called proteinase K. And what that does is destroys the normal prion protein that exists uh, in all mammalian species. That allows the expression of the abnormal prion protein um, to survive because they are so robust, these, these abnormal prions. Um, and you know, much literature has been written about um, how significant prions are and how robust they are in the environment. So with this process, we're able to destroy the normal prion protein and allow the abnormal prion to uh, persist. Once this whole process is done, the deep well plate is centrifuged at 10,000 um, RPMs for 10 minutes. And that's done um, under cool conditions. And essentially what's happening is all of the, the solid particulate matter that was in the sample is pushed down to the bottom of the well, creating a pellet, a uh, pelletized protein. And above that is all of the liquid that was added to the sample from the time it was added to the tube, to the uh, proteinase K, and then the stop solution for the protein purification. That liquid on the top is called a supernatant, 
That is then extracted with another automated machine, which is just right behind Aaron. Uh, this is a deep well um, plate washer, and it uses suction to pull all of the liquid out of that plate. We then allow the plate to dry for five minutes upside down, making sure all the supernatant is out. And then we add uh, the next solution called Buffer C, which basically resuspends the, the, pelletized, the pelletized prion um, and opens it up to allow it to attach to antibodies on the microtiter plate. So we do that uh, both chemically and physically by heat. We use a, a 100 degrees Celsius incubator. Uh, 100 degrees Celsius, as most people know, is the boiling point of water. Uh, very hot and that allows the, the prion proteins to open up. The next step then is moving to a, a standard micro titer plate. Take an example off of this stack. Um, so these are old plates that we keep around as trophies from last year to see which day we were the most productive. Um, and you can see last year on December 8th, when we received the testing kits from BioRad finally after a long, long reprieve, um, I think we tested 24 or 28 plates in one day. That represents uh, quite a few samples. So 28 times 90. Aaron, how's your math? <laughs> Not that good. <laughs> 25, 2600, something like that. Um, so the, the beauty of the BioRad ELISA is that these micro titer plates are coated with an antibody on the bottom of the well. So we, we put the sample in and it's a very specific reaction that binds to that abnormal prion protein. And the, the nor normal prion protein, which does not exist anymore because it was destroyed in this last step, cannot cross-react. Uh, from this point, once the sample has been added uh, to the microtiter plate, we put a cover on it and we incubate it at four degrees Celsius, which is around this side of the room. So it's cooled back down, which facilitates that reaction um, and ensures up that binding of the antigen to the primary antibody. Uh, after that 30 minute incubation, we come back to this side of the room where we have a, a standard uh, microtiter plate plate washer. And what this does is use, uses the, the BioRad wash um, to pull out all of the sample that was on the plate um, inject some of the wash solution and essentially get get the sample ready for the next step. Uh, in this case, it's the conjugate, which acts as a secondary antibody. Um, so you've got an antibody on the bottom, you've got the abnormal prion protein as the antigen in the middle, and you've got another antibody on the top. Um, this incubation is, I actually misspoke, that the first incubation is done at 37 degrees Celsius, and then the secondary uh, or the second incubation is done at four degrees Celsius. So the conjugate has been added. Um, we're cooling at four degrees for 30 minutes again. We'll do the plate washing step. Uh, again, what that's doing is removing the, the chemical that was on the sample and making it ready for the, the final um, substrate solution, which is the chromogen to be added. So if you want an action shot, um, there you go with the, the deep well plate and the supernatant being extracted through vacuum and suction. Um, of course, all of this liquid is captured into a waste container. Um, and all of our liquid waste here is processed through our um, alkaline hydrolysis tissue digester, uh, which is the only machine capable of destroying the prion, uh, abnormal prion protein. Okay, so we've gone through our, our whole process. And at the end, what we're left with is one of those micro titer plates. If the sample is positive for CWD, it will turn the liquid in the well blue. We then add a stop solution, which causes a dramatic change in the pH, which changes the color to yellow. That yellow color in the micro titer plate is then read on an automated micro titer plate reader uh, attached to a software. And what it does is reads the optical density at two different wavelengths. Uh, and the software calculates the difference. Based on the negative and positive controls, it establishes cutoff values. Uh, those, those cutoff values uh, will then determine if a sample is an initial reactor um, or if it's not detected. 
So the difference between those two test results, not detected, means that the, the sample that we received from the DNR and that was subsampled into our micro titer tube did not contain abnormal prion protein. If it was an initial reactor, it means it did contain that abnormal infectious prion protein. Um, and based on where that result came from, um, the, the DNR will either interpret that as uh, a truly positive sample or will request immunohistochemistry, which is the, the confirmatory test. Um, so Aaron, I don't know if you want to jump in here since you are the data coordinator. Yeah, well thank you Dan. It's, I always think it's really interesting to see all the steps that go into getting a CWD test result for your deer. So I just want to uh, finish up with how those results get to you is, you know, as we saw the process, then WVDL will send us the results through an automated system. Our CWD database will upload those results and negatives will be posted that evening. So if you have your email attached to your Go Wild account, you will get an email right away. So add it if you would like to see that. Otherwise, it's always available online on our website at uh, dnr.wi.gov, keyword CWD result. Um, so then you can look it up there as well. So I also just want to end, and positives are, are uploaded as soon as they're checked. Uh, so we do check to make sure the location is, is there for those ones as well. So I just want to thank Dan again uh, and also mention that Dan and his crew go above and beyond to help us with our turnaround time. They put in extra shifts. They have extra people come on board during right after the nine day. Uh, so we really appreciate all the extra work they do for us. We're extremely lucky to have this partner right in our backyard, right here in Southern Wisconsin. So thank you again for the tour. Thank you, Erin.